absolutely phenomenal, I must say so myself, Steve, if I'm being brutally honest. I mean, I can remember back in the day as well, where I went to one of my mentors, right? You know, he was a pivotal mentor of mine. And I went in there and I was, I was fucked up in many ways. I still had all that anger. I had all that trauma of the past. I was still violent, the paranoia, all them feelings, all that stuff, right? And he said to me, Steve, you only need to change one thing. I said, what's that? He said, everything. And from that point, that was important to me. It takes time as a process, but I get what you're saying. And for me, I had to change absolutely everything. Uh, People, places, and things from the inside out. That was my thing along this journey to where, to where I am today, you know? I'm still going through my nut, and I don't think it's ever going to stop. I don't, I'm, I'm growing every minute of every day. I still have issues with my relationships. I still have issues with my children. I still have issues with communicating to normal people. But I'm learning how to address them issues with the right mindset, the right frequency, and the right product. So... I'm like a, a born again human being and I'm learning how to do things in the correct manner. So I'm not beating myself up when I hit a hurdle or when I slip on a, a banana skin. You know, I'm not doing that because that'll just end me up back in prison. Like someone said to me the other day, what would you do if you see the geezer that shot you? I said, honestly? He said, yeah. I said, I'll ask him to draw a program with me to deliver him because I've deliver, I, I developed programs now to deliver in prisons and schools. So I said, I'd ask him to de- develop a program on forgiveness, yeah, and help me deliver it across the country. That's what I would do if I met the geezer that shot me, do you know what I'm saying? Because for him doing what the biggest, baddest gangsters in London was never capable of doing, yeah, or never had the arsehole or the confidence or the courage, because I was a lunatic, right? And this guy shot me because he had to shoot me but it was the best thing that ever happened in my life, getting shot five times. Do you understand? Because without that, I wouldn't have had to reflect on my life. I wouldn't have had... That made me realise all the people in my life are not my friends because no one come to the hospital to see me. It broke my heart when they never come to the hospital. I thought, these bad. All my people going to come. I thought they'd come and look after me, give me hundreds of thousands of pounds to live for the next couple of years so I could walk. I never got a tenner. I never got a tenner. In yeah. fact, it was a fucking stranger that helped me out. And rest his soul, right? Rest his soul. The first person that ever helped me after I got shot was a man called Dave Campbell. And I'll give him his prop because he was. And then I went on to move into certain environments and do certain things with other organisations and other people. And then things grew up. Things blew up and things went like phenomenally out of control. I get exceptional people with exceptional journeys like you to interview on here because... It's about the richness in there and the jewels, you know. I mean, for instance, you know, there is such a relevance between gang leaders, uh, career criminals, people at that level, and CEOs. All these leadership skills. We want to go inside there to have a look at making things better, but what the exceptional parts are, you know, and that less known content to give that to people so they can consider it so it will help them on their journey. Now, look, I have to ask, You know, I mean, you was nearly killed. We've been through a lot of that stuff. I've been through that. You know, I've been shot at and stuff like that. Never to the never to the level that you was. You shot five times, Marvin. Yeah. What was it actually like? Them moments of knowing you're going to be shot like that and going through that. I know you went through immense pain in hospital. What was it like? A guy took a watch off a friend of mine. Right. Uh, my driver, so someone's driving me about. We've gone round my mate's house one day, and my mate's asked, because I was a bit of a watch freak. I had all the top watches, right? So he's asked me if I wanted a couple of APs or a couple of protects, and I was like, no, I'm all right, I've got them. I've got them ones, I've got that one, I'm, like, I'm sweet. So then the driver said, can I have that one? Which was a, I think it was a Ferrari edition Panerai, no more than 15,000 pounds to buy in retail. So it wasn't that much of an expensive watch in consideration that the watches I normally bought was in the 50s and the hundreds of thousands of pound bracket, right? So when he said oh, 15 grand, I looked at me mate, my mate said, yeah, 15 quid. I said, and I think it wasn't 15 quid, it was retail at 15 quid. I think he had to pay three grand for the watch, right? So I said, yeah, I've give, I've got him that Monday, I've got him that Tuesday, not a problem. I've got, when I pay him his wages, he'll pay you. 
<clears throat> anyway, me and this kid fell out over the space of the next couple of months, over a couple of little sneaky little moves he done. And I just always said to him, I don't want you around me no more. Get on with your life. Get on with it. So he's gone in his own direction. I've gone mine. A couple of months later, my mates rang me up and said, Marv, I'm not being funny. Any chance you can square that watch? I was like, what watch? I ain't going to watch off you. He said, no, no, no. Your pal, the driver, he took that watch, sat down. I was like, what? Ain't he paid you for that? The cheeky fuck. So I rang him up. I said, mate, what are you doing? I said, you need to go and pay for this fucking watch, mate. So he's gone, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you putting it on me for? I said, hold on. You took a watch out of my mate's ass, yeah, on the strength of me, yeah, paying for the watch. Now, you ain't paid for the watch, so I've got to pay for it. Now, if I've got to pay for it, I'm going to punch your fucking head in, mate. You're taking the piss. Now, I want you to go and give him the ready for the watch, or I'm coming to take it. He said, I think you're trying to bully me, mate. I was like, what? Are you having a laugh? So I jumped in my car. I said, where are you? I said, I'm down the pool. So I've turned up in the pool. He weren't there. His mate, Mark Carpel, was sitting there. I said, mate, where's your mate? He said, oh, he's going to get something. I said, yeah, he's going to get a tool, yeah? Sweet, not a problem. So I said, do you know what your mate's all about? I said, do you know what this is all about? He's gone, not really, no. So I've explained to him what it was all about. So he went to me, oh, do you know what, mate? Go home, yeah? I'll bring him down the gym. Or I think I was in the gym in um, San Pedro Poligono. He said, I'll bring him down to Polygono tomorrow. You can sort it out. I said, no, fuck that. If he's going to get a tool, yeah, we can deal with this now, mate. Not a problem. Me thinking, because I know the kid, I didn't think he'd have a gun. I thought he'd have a bat, a sword, a bit of gas or something, right? So when he's turned up with a gun, he's like, he's lifting his finger up. I said, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? You fucking mug. So in my head, I'm thinking, I've got to get to him to get the gun off him. So I'm, I'm walking towards him to get the gun. He's pulled the gun out. And as he's point, I said, you better do what you're going to do, mate. And I've sort of gone towards him to get the gun. And he shot me in the leg. And I'll show you, I'll send you the x-ray. So it shattered my leg into hundreds of pieces. I'll just collapse straight away. So then obviously I'll just say, do your fucking job, you mug. Because I didn't believe he'd have the arsehole to kill me. So I said, do your fucking job, you mug. And he's gone, bang, bang. And I thought, oh, oh, he shot me three times. One went through my arm, off me, off, out, through my pelvis. One went down my willy, shot my right testicle into my pants. And I'll just, I never said a word after that, because if I'm being honest. You thought this <laughs> is it, right? After, after the third shot, it went through my willy, yeah, and blew yeah. my testicle into my pants. I thought, this cunt's going to kill me. And yeah. he went towards me, and I thought, ah, oh, we go. And then the instant thought was, my daughter's only two weeks old. Wow. He can't kill me. He can't kill me. And then he's gone, put a gun to my head and he's gone, bang, bang. And that was it. I thought, I'm dead. I thought, I'm dead. I'm dead. Fuck. And I'm lying there and I've heard, Marvin, is that you? Marvin, is that you? And I actually believed I was in heaven. I actually believed I'd gone over. Right? Because I've had a couple of experience prior to this. And I thought, wow, I can't believe it. I'm dead. And I'm going, what's happening? I've turned around like that, opened my eye. And I've seen my mate from the gym. And I was like, what the fuck? I've looked around, I was like, damn, and I'm trying to move, ah! I couldn't move, my leg was fucked. So I said, mate, 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 get to my car and get my phone out of my car, quick. Because I'd read a few books, Andy McNabb and all that in prison, right? I actually believed I was gonna go into shock, right? Yeah. So I said to him, get the phone out of my car, quick, quick, quick. So he's got the phone out of my car, I rung a couple of people, I said, mate, silly bollocks, you fucking done me, mate. He shot me five times, I think I'm gonna go over. Let matey know, boom, 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 boom. Hello, mate, yeah, look, I've been shot five times, mate. This fucking cunt's done me. I can't see, I can't, I'm gone, he's shot me in my head, I'm gonna go, please, just relax. Anyway, so then, in my head, he's saying to me, relax, 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 breathe. Andy McNabb, I remember reading one of his books, and he said, you gotta breathe to get your heart rate down, which stops the, the blood flow, right? Yeah, so absolutely. Like, They're hospital. adrenaline, right? They're adrenaline. Yeah, so I rung the missus to let her know where it was happened. She's not picking the phone up because she's in the shop next door to us, courting glaze, looking for a new buggy for the baby. So I had to focus on my breathing, my breathing, my breathing. So I'm breathing, 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 breathing. And then the police turn up. No. And then I've rung an ambulance, um, helicopter sanitarius. There's all private um, ambulances over there. So I've rung my helicopter sanitarius. They said, oh, what's the emergency? I said, I'm not being funny. I've just been shot. Pardon? I've just been shot. Where? I said, I don't know. I've just been shot five times. And they hung up. So I've rung back. 
I said, I'm not joking, I'm not joking. I've been shot in Port Canoes. I've been shot five times. They've hung up again. And then the police have turned up and then the police have called the ambulance. The ambulance has come and took me to the hospital. I've gone in. I remember getting hot, um, wheeled down the corridor and I've gone to the, the, the doctor. I said, mate, like, obviously in Spanish, I said, no matter what you do, save the leg. I don't care how much it costs, save the leg. Let so me ask crazy. you, look, you know, because I know Port Banus well, especially that strip down there. Right. You know, I go over there quite a lot. I've got friends over there. Where about some Port Banus to this happen? Do you remember Solly's? Yeah. Right, outside Solly's it was. Because he was sitting in Solly's when I, when I met him, when I, when I went down there. Yeah, so he was sitting inside Solly's. And, like, I, I've come outside Solly's and it was on the pavement. Because when I'm sitting talking to that carpel, I've seen him walk across the road by the corner of court in Glace. So I've jumped up and gone outside because I just wanted to have a straightener with a fella. I said, come well, on, they're right not being silly bollocks. Yeah. And then I said, he's gone like that with a gun. I said, what are you going to do with that? And that's when he's bang, 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 bang. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then basically I've said, save the leg, save the leg, save the leg. And then I'll, I'll send you the picture because the very next morning when I've woke up, Obviously, I've gone onto the operating table, blah, 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 blah. I woke up in the morning, I remember looking down at my toes, and I thought, as long as I can wiggle my toes, I'm going to be able to walk again. And I wiggled my toes, and I was happy. So I was like, yeah, we're good, we're good. Got on the phone, and then basically, I got a little bit paranoid that they were going to come up the hospital and try and kill me after they realised I was shot. So then what I've done, I've told everybody that I had septicemia, and I think I'm going to go over. Because the first three days I had armed police outside the door, and then I've asked the police if they'd go, because I wanted all my friends to come over from England and come and see me. But people weren't going to come to the hospital, because I've, I've got a core circle of friends that actually come. But the people that I'd actually made money with and done that, I've actually risked my life. My, I was expecting 36 years in 2002 for a firm of people, and I got the not guilty by the grace of God and come out and went to Spain. But things I've actually done for people, risked my liberty, sat in prison, I mean, like, I actually thought they'd come and show some sort of solidarity. And it was that that broke my heart and never come. So after the third day, the police have gone. I thought, what happens if these lot come? So I've got a couple of people around me. I had a couple of guns. So I made sure I had a gun in my bed all the time. And then basically, a couple of my mates come over. Everything was good. And then I put out there for the first two weeks that I had set to see me. And I was a good chance I'm going to die. And then when my pals got over and I had the gun in the room, then it was like, right, we're back to normal. I was back on the phone. Yeah, sweet. What's happening? Any of this, any of that. Crash by wallet, crash by wallet. And I just started making money again like nothing had happened. You know, and it weren't, like I said, it weren't until 2012 and 2015 I actually decided that crime, crime wasn't worth it. Look, thanks for that, Marvin. You know, and I would say, certainly, I mean, you know, that that's a miracle. You are a miracle. My femoral artery got punctured in three places. Wow. And when the bones shattered, they, the bones come out of my leg and through the femoral artery, and I never even bled. That is they told against me all I'd medical never, ever walk again. understanding, man. They told me I'd never walk again unaided, right? Mm. Two and a half years to the day, yeah, two and a half years to the day, I had a professional boxing fight on a world title underdog. Yeah, I see that. Right? And I, I see won. some stuff on that. Oh, come on, man. How do you get to that? From that? Do you know what I mean? A world title undercard. D. Williams from Belfast. D. Williams from Belfast had his world title opportunity and I was the undercard on the night on a Sergio Martinez production in Spain. Unbelievable. And I won. And even when you watch the fight, it's on YouTube. Marvin's boxing match. Marvin with an S. Marvin's boxing match on YouTube. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I must admit, I had a little look at that because, you know, it's a very, very inspiring story and I get it all the way through and that is, um, that's a real testament to your spirit, certainly, and the human spirit. Now, look, we're going we're gonna to go into some of the real inspirational things that you've gone on to do. Before we do that, I want you to just, you know... Uh, give us a bit of detail because there was another really, really dark period in your life where you was arrested. You know, you know they were saying you was a hitman, uh, an enforcer. You know, you was caught with a list of all these names. A lot of them, you know, had already been assassinated, right, and all this stuff. You was found not guilty of this. What's the real story there, Marvin, with that? What actually happened there with that? You know, 
You know, the narrow so what version. Is, what actually happened? It was a fit up. Right? And I know, I don't listen, listen to me. Everybody says, oh, yeah, everything's a fit up. But I'll tell you what happened. Um, do you remember Barry Hibbard and John Toomey got arrested for the Heathrow stuff? I do, yeah. I, I, I was do. supposed to be arrested for them on that because they had my DNA on the motorbike and down the, in the crash helmet. And they actually come and arrested me after for other... Anyway, so... Because we were so prolific, right, in drugs, violence, and sort of robberies, right? And we couldn't, they couldn't convict us on lots of things. And we got away with lots of things. Like, I'm not trying to glorify that crime lifestyle, but I got away with a hell of a lot of stuff to the point where the police had to do something. And I don't blame them for doing what they've done, because I would have done the same thing if I was a policeman. I was getting away with everything, right? And I couldn't be convicted. And it was just one of them things. And I got arrested for a couple of shootings. I got arrested for a couple of robberies. I got arrested for under investigation for murders and loads of things. But as police officers being police officers, they're getting frustrated because he's got to be doing something. He's got, he's with this one, he's with that one, he's with this one, he's with, it's got to be him, it's got to be him. So what they tried to do is fit me up with Barry and them, like put my DNA on the moat, right? But then prior to that, what happened? We got arrested for a machine gun and a silencer. Um, and basically what they said is we was a yardy hit team on a mission to kill so many people because we was having a war over territory. So I think two or three people had been killed. Um, five or six people had been shot. Um, it was constant conflict, like tit for tat shootings, like cars got sprayed up, houses got booted off, people got shot, people got kidnapped, people got tortured, you know, and it was just going a bit chaotic. So basically, we got arrested because on the night, we used to look after a guy, I can't remember his, his, his whole name, Seamus something, he used to run a pub in Shepherd's Bush. Now, Every 31st of July, he used to do the Irish racing over Kempton. So we was his bodyguards because he used to bring the money back to Shepherd's Bush. So we used to go over there firm-handed, wear a vest. I mean, he didn't know we was told up, but we'd have a couple of little bits and pieces on us and we'd go and do what we're doing. Bring him home, drop him off and go about our business. So this one night, like, we've dropped him off. We've got in the cab. Now, I used to live in Barnet. So I've got to go to Kentish Town to get a bit of puff because I used to smoke weed really strong back then. So I'm going to get a bit of weed before I go home. So I'm not armed. I'm not armed. My mates are not armed, right? So we're going to get a bit of puff before we go home. As we've turned up to get a bit of puff, we're walking up a road. The road's just come alive with old Dar Bill, right? Now, how I know it was a fitter, we had the regional crime squad, we had soccer, and we had the anti-terrorist group. An inspector from each unit on the spot within three minutes, Stephen. Right? Doesn't happen. Does it, it doesn't like happen, that. mate. Right? And there was uh, maybe 55 police officers within three minutes. And I'm like, what the fuck? Anyway, cut a long story short. One of the police officers has gone to his community support officer. Listen, there's a gun around here somewhere. We've got to look for it. How could you assume there's a gun on a street when you just stop three people? So they've stopped us. They're searching for this gun for ages. Can't find it. Can't find it. Can't find it. And all of a sudden, we get put in the cars, go get taken down to the police station, and then hold up, they find a machine gun. A MAC-10 silencer, armor-piercing bullets, subsonic bullets, so you don't hear no supersonic boom. The silencer muffles the sound of a gun crack, and we're a hit team. So then we get arrested. We go away. While we're away, yeah, they start saying that we're responsible for 87% of the gun crime in London, these guns are responsible for X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Right? So then we go to trial. We go to trial. And they said that the difference between this organisation and every other organisation, we're professionals. We are so forensically aware that they won't find anything on us. And our guns was in pristine condition. One of the, the gun that they found hadn't even been fired. Right? But then when they've come to trial, they brought a gun in as exhibit, which was about 50 years old. 
So we're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. That ain't brand new. So I said to the defence, I said, hold on a minute. Have a look at the, um, the forensic report to the firearms. You say on page whatever that the firearm is immaculate and it hadn't even been fired. Now, I am no gun expert. But if you look at that gun, it looks about 50 years old. You can see where it's been cocked about thousands of times. I said, it doesn't look brand new. So the judges said, let's have a look. The judges had a look. And he said, the jury needs to see this. So he's giving it to the jury. Right? And on that basis, we got the not guilty. Because you could see that it was a fitter. The match, yeah. I mean, yeah. look, look. I, I hear that. All I can say is per, personal experience. When I went to the Bailey, we screamed fitter. They definitely moved items around and all that. And look, as you say, you know, in that live, you know, Marvin, so you're you getting away with a lot of stuff. They can cock stuff and they say, look, you know, he's a target criminal, career criminal. That's it. We'll You've take him off the street the anyway. Right? The I mean, that's how it works, yeah? Me personally, when they when we got Nick, I was getting 36 years recommended. That was it. So they've come in, they said, right, Herbert, we'll give you a deal. I said, what deal? They said, we'll give one of your co-defendants no more than five years. I said, go fuck yourself. I said, for what? I know you're fitting me up, you no know, good cunt. There's no way I'm pleading guilty to that. And then obviously, my co-defendant took a deal, yeah? And then we got found guilty by association and got five and a half years. And that's why I went to prison on my last sentence.